Democratic First Nations, uh, and the Métis Nation. So this territory exists in connection with the one dish, one spoon wampum belt, a peace treaty and mutual agreement established between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to care for the land and the precious resources around the Great Lakes, uh, the dish representing the land itself and the spoon representing responsibility in sharing its resources, uh, never taking more than you need and sharing with others. Uh, we must continue to uphold this treaty, both as indigenous folks and non-indigenous slash settler folks, as it addresses the entirety of our relationships and relations. Uh, for XSpace, uh, this treaty informs our intention to support artists who exist on the margins uh, through public programming and the sharing of additional resources for arts practitioners, uh, a sharing of knowledge, hospitality, and opportunity. Um, our fellow peers uh, across this vibrant arts community that has since developed here. Uh, and we do stand in solidarity with indigenous communities against the violent forces and effects of colonialism. We wish for this land acknowledgement to also function as a call to action. Uh, so dismantling systemic racism and white supremacy within the institutions and systems we exist in, as well as continuing to fight for indigenous sovereignty, rights and stewardship of the land are just a few of the many forms in which support can take. Uh, we, use, we seek to use the resources available to us as an arts institution in order to work towards these goals within our projects and programming. Uh, and as we see land acknowledgements rapidly become automated and co-opted by institutions, we recognize the inherent failure in the limits of the land acknowledgement itself. But you know, despite these intrinsic failings, and still including one, we would like to honor the land acknowledgement as something that's growing, uh, that's alive and ever shifting and unable to be completed. So an endless process of change as we commit to always be reflecting, responding and learning to about what it means to live and work on stolen land. And, in regards to my own personal specific context, um, I'm the son of immigrant parents uh, who moved to Canada from the Philippines in 1989, uh, six years before I was born in 1995. Um, cultivating new beginnings from the ground up in a new place means that my family, uh, countless other immigrant families and members of the Filipino diaspora specifically, uh, hold our new homes with a special kind of reverence. Um, but despite these perceived ownership of land and the complexities of the immigrant experience and conversations around displacement, uh, that relationship to land is still rooted in colonial ideals. Uh, you know, we're still settlers on this land that is not, never truly has been ours. And I think this isn't talked about enough in immigrant communities. I personally didn't realize this until much later in my life. And likewise, I don't think this was ever made apparent to my parents either. Um, so I've been trying to unweave these embodied understandings in an effort to understand my place on this land, um, who I am as a cultural worker and an artist and a general human being. And we encourage you all to think about your own unique relationships to it as well. So about XSpace. Uh, founded in 2004, XSpace Cultural Center is an artist-run space located at the intersection of Lansdowne and Dundas mandated towards supporting the professional development of emerging artists, designers, curators, writers, and other creatives in the city of Takaranzo. Uh, among the ways in which XSpace does so include showing work by emerging arts practitioners across our four exhibition spaces, um, through which our entire programming year is selected through an annual open call for submissions, um, and also <laughs> our 2021 to 2022 open call for submissions uh, just released yesterday. Uh, we'd also like to say that you don't need any prior exhibition history to show with us. Um, we oftentimes show work by artists who have never shown ever before. Uh, so for all you incoming OKU students, it's never too early to begin your career as an artist and we're here to support you on that journey. Um, we also commission essays from emerging writers to accompany all of our exhibitions. Uh, we host free workshops, events, and other programming that range from really practical things like um, tax workshops and grant writing to really fun things like DJing or tarot card reading. If you have an idea for a workshop uh, that you'd like to share, uh, we have an ongoing call for workshop facilitators that we can drop in the chat later. Uh, yeah, and we also commissioned posters for all of these workshops and events from emerging illustrators and graphic designers. So definitely a lot of ways to work with us. So we encourage you to get involved. Uh, and XSpace is interested in fighting against the perceived notion that artists do not need to get paid or are paid in like, like exposure, uh, meaning that XSpace commits to equitable exchanges for labor. And that means that everything we do, uh, all our opportunities are paid. We also have a Facebook group in which we share paid opportunities for artists um, or free or pay what you can workshops and events in the city that span beyond 
uh, what XSpace is doing with our programming. Uh, I always find that there's a lot going on in Toronto, uh, which is great, but could be hard to like wayfind your way through. So we always try and re repost um, a lot of different ways in which artists can get involved in art in the city. Uh, so please check that out. And um, so unfortunately, Emily from the SU couldn't make it to um, this event to talk about what the SU does. But um, for context, uh, we are funded by the OCAD SU. We're definitely a resource for artists and o the OCAD Student Union is as well. Um, Emily's given us a blurb to read. Um, so if you can just imagine Natalie as Emily, uh, <laughs> she, can, she can read that out for you. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie King. I am one of two programming coordinators at XSpace. So if any of you have any questions or comments or would like any feedback on your proposals, if you're interested in writing, you can message either I or Philip at natalie at xspace.info or philip at xspace.info. So the OCAD Student Union. Um, the OCAD Student Union is you, consisting of current students and political members. Once you were enrolled in 0.5 credits, you are automatically a member of the SU and, and can access services, attend events, apply for jobs. And after graduating, all students become political members for one year and have access to all the same things you had as a student for 12 months after you graduate. The OCAD SU provides many services geared towards student support, including a student advocate, Khadijah Farrow, who can help you assist with issues with administrative departments, faculty or staff, including but not limited to instances of harassment, filing petitions or other forms, and attending hearings or meetings with your support. The OCAD SU also provides access to free legal support and have a lawyer who can give advice on tenancy and landlord issues, copywriting, small claims, and more. The lawyer is available to meet with students on Friday mornings throughout the year. Students who would like to book an appointment with Khadijah can email advocate at ocadsu.org. I can drop these links in the chat later as well. Another service that the OCAD USU provides is access to food security for students, including a weekly food box donation program and grocery gift, gift cards. Once we're back on campus, the weekly food box donation program is replaced by our open access student pantry, which contains non-perishable and healthy fresh food for students to access as needed, no questions asked. The SU also runs a twice weekly hot lunch program where student staff cook um, a pay what you can donation based healthy meal where students can eat well and connect with their peers on campus. In addition to these supports, the OCAD SU also runs a few programs to help students develop their art and design skills and start their careers. The SU micro contract gives students an opportunity to create commissioned art or design work, practice their skills when pre presenting concepts and receiving feedback and or to develop their portfolio. All styles, materials, and mediums are welcome. However, workshop videos will be sent to the selected artists as source materials, and they strongly suggest that the creator's con concept or material choice reflects the workshop content in some ways. Selected students will be asked to consider the scale at which their finished work will be seen, and uh, work must fit within size requirements for an IGTV cover. If you're interested in this opportunity, you could visit ocadsu.org. Each micro contract includes two concept meetings with a feedback committee consisting of SU staff and board members. In the first meeting, the artist designer will be required to present their process, an initial draft to the committee for feedback, while the second meeting will present a more finalized version of the cover to the committee for approval. Students will gain paid experience for their work and will have a commissioned piece to include in their portfolio. Due to COVID, um, they have also been running an art and design workshop series and will be releasing another call for facilitators soon. They're currently looking for proposals of tips and tricks style workshops that teach specific art design or writing skills that would be beneficial for incoming students to know. These workshops should focus on using readily available household supplies or materials and software that students could be using in their first year at OCADU. The delivery of these workshops will be remote, hosted as a Zoom meeting, and you'll be required to have a computer, working internet connection, and a webcam in order to deliver the workshop. The proposed workshop should be approximately 45 minutes long with step-by-step -step demonstration and 15 minutes for questions. Um, 
yeah, so the OCAD SU will be releasing an uh, open call for five micro contracts and five workshops in early May. So keep an eye out on their website, OCADSU.org, and follow them on Facebook, OCAD Student Union, and Instagram at OCADSU for more information on how to apply. So thank you for listening <laughs> to that blurb. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to our lovely programming assistant and just all around wonderful artist in person, How Fam, to start um, from us to you. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to the start again. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining me for From Us to You, which is a conversation on the art school experience. I wanted to put this together because um, I'm me and the two other artists in the panel, we're going to be on our ways out of OCAD very soon and, you know, kind of walking out into the fine art world. And we had a lot of experiences and ups and downs while we were students at OCAD. And we felt like if we were able to share um, the things that we learned, the things that we went through with students who are currently still at OCAD, who are just entering OCAD, and also anyone who is just intrigued and curious about the art school experience, I think it would be a really wonderful thing for us and for a lot of younger students as well. And this is just the agenda for today. So we already went through the introduction from XSpace, um, Student Union, and then we're going to go into meeting the artists. So me, Maria, and Claire will learn a lot about our practices and um, how our work has changed from um, our first year at OCAD to the kind of work that we're making now as um, fourth year students. Uh, we're gonna have a bit of a conversation between the, um, the three artists, just talking about um, how we met, how our work intersects, how we see our work progressing, and also how our work has changed due to the COVID situation. How has remote learning affected our practices? How has it um, made it easier for us or harder for us to um, learn as students and also um, in our professional practice, we'll have a 15 minute break and then we'll go into a Q&A, um, a list of resources that we put together that we think would be really great for anyone who is still uh, a young or young stu um, art student or an emerging artist and also an informal critique. So if you have a work um, of yours on your computer that you would like to get some critique from, you can share that with us during the break and I'll just go it back into the um, artist intro. So this is just workshop etiquette. And I think everyone is um, pretty good for now. But um, we ask just that everyone has their mics off so that the program will run smoothly. Um, if you guys can tell also, I am recording this presentation. So if any other students who weren't able to make it or are interested in hearing this, they'll be able to access this later on. If you have any questions at all throughout the program, we ask that you please leave them in the chat and we'll answer them during the Q&A. So if you have a question that is in particular to a specific slide, please put it in the chat because we'll be willing to go back and um, answer them. And also if you have a question that is specific to either me, um, Maria or Claire, please put our names at the front of the question. It'll make it a lot easier for us to answer them to the best of our abilities. And then once the Q&A and informal critique starts we also encourage participants to turn on their mics to ask questions or give comments and feedback because we would like to see your faces and also see like what the future of OCAD is starting to look like. So now we can meet the artists. So I've already introduced myself, but my name is Hao Pham and I go by she, her, and I'm Maria and I also go by she, her. And I'm Claire, I go by she, her. Thanks for the intro, Hao. And um, if you guys, I would love um, for you guys to introduce yourselves in the comments as well. So let us know your names, your pronouns, what program you're in, and also what year of study you're in as well. Or if um, you haven't even started OCAD yet. I know some of you guys have met me through admissions. So some of you just recently got your acceptance to OCAD, I think maybe like a week or two ago, which is very exciting. So please just let us know your name, pronouns, and program in the chat and we can get started. So we're gonna start with myself and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my practice and what I'm working with right now. So 
I'm in the drawing and painting program and I'm in my fourth year. So I'm, I have finished up my thesis and me and Claire are actually participating in the Grad X show for this year, which is all online. And uh, we, all we both graduate in June. So I'm just gonna read out my artist statement a little bit and then we can get started into looking more at my work. So, I aim to reduce paintings that reflect myself, exploring ideas of the Asian female identity to understand how one values themselves and how that value is determined by others. Translating these reflections with oil paint, my works communicate guilt, confusion, and uncertainty embedded in the history of ornamentalism. So it wasn't really until my thesis year that I was able to figure out what kind of ideas I was exploring, but I really am interested in my personal experiences and how that has um, reflected into my work. So a lot of the things that I paint are things that I'm really fascinated with. They're also things that make me feel very guilty. They make me really confused. And oftentimes these feelings intersect with one another. And um, that's what I hope to explore in my practice. And, um, and also one thing that I think is um, really obvious is that me, Maria, and Claire are um, three Asian identifying woman artists. So our practices in many ways, they align a lot with this um, concept of the Asian female identity. But at the same time, we have a lot of um, separate experiences, preferences, um, roles in the world that make our practices really different as well. So that's why I wanted to have a panel of us three together because I wanted to show like this the small, the small um, similarities and differences that can exist between three artists who um, have similar backgrounds, um, were, are in similar programs, and are, not, are also in the same year as one another. So I'm going to transition into looking at some of my early work. So this is <laughs> this is a really um, early early work. So if you guys are in first year or if you have already taken your first year at OCAD. You have to take a course which is called, um, I think, Introduction to Drawing. The name might have changed um, throughout the years. It might have been different 10 years ago, and it might have been different last year. But this is where you learn the basics of drawing. And one of the very first assignments that you have to do is that you do a quite a large um, graphite drawing, and you're supposed to find um, a collage of different objects in your home, I believe, and somehow combine it together. This is not a this is not a good drawing by any means. I but you can kind of see how um, I take I'm taking the subjects that I'm interested in and relating them to my current works now. And I didn't really have a good um, grasp of space or um, uh, or understanding of how things um, will look next to each other. I had a very poor planning process as well. Um, for me, Maria and Claire, none of us actually use a, a sketchbook very much to plan out our work, which is one thing that uh, we've been able to relate with each other quite a bit. But even with this, I didn't really plan out the order of how I would draw things. I didn't really think about how certain items would, would look next to each other. So in the very end, the objects looked really, really confusing and really crowded in the front, but also really empty in the back. And I also am not very good with like drawing mediums. So I, I prefer to use oil paint, but in your first year, one thing that I emphasize a lot with is that you should try every medium that you can. So your first year, you're introduced to all these different types of paints. You're introduced to all these types of drawing mediums. If you can get your hands on all of them, um, kind of experiment with them, do a lot of work with them, um, it'll, it'll show you what you're really good at, what you're interested at, and what mediums you should kind of utilize more as you go up the years at OCAD. So I'm going to jump in here for a second. I don't think I did that project in first year. Um, I remember I was in drawing across disciplines, uh -huh. and we did more like experimental stuff, kind of like just getting into mark making. Um, but I want to point out that the different objects in these pieces, this drawing here, reoccur in your later paintings. So I think that's really nice to see. So if I look at the eyelashes in the corner, 
or um, the Buddha, what else, the cat, all these things I see in your later work and I've never seen this piece before and I think it's hilarious. It took me a while to find like an image of this piece because I have a tendency to delete images of work that I don't like. So I had to really go through it, but I thought it would be like a good progress since there's a lot of similarities in subjects to the work I do now. And also just like my skill level from 2017 to 2021. Um, and Maria was actually in this class with me as well. So she saw she saw me as I was making this work and my yeah. work process and how, how, how kind of bad it was at the time. <laughs> this was actually the final work for that class. So you can see I actually didn't make that much progress in terms of the semester. And one thing that's kind of um, interesting about these two works is that there's a third one, but I lost the third one in the OCAD studios. So I ended up coming late to my critique with only two paintings. You gotta and do what you gotta do, man. <laughs> yeah. I was I, I, I was still really interested in this idea of representing the object. So with my current practice now, I'm exploring a lot of the Asian feminine identity by the depiction of objects and in history to um, the depiction of still lives. So there's a really, really long um, history of the still life and how these specific things that are painted for hours um, are representative of people or reflections of what people desire, what they treasure, what they relate to. And in ways I was trying to explore that here, but at the time I didn't really true, I didn't really understand why I was doing this. So with this one, I was trying to show like the concept of movement a little bit with my final project. And I was looking at um, streetwear. So streetwear is like, a lot of a lot of clothing brands that are um, very popular with the youth and they have like these interesting motifs or logos or brands that um, people find really fascinating especially with um the converse which is the come des garçon and then with the nike at the time um it was with the off-white collaboration which um, a lot of people found really popular at the time and i thought it was interesting considering um, it was just a a specific logo that was added to a pair of Jordans that were already popular, but it suddenly made the markup of the object go like up to like a thousand dollars. So I found that really fascinating um, how people can treasure something so much, but these, th these works are really bad. <laughs> and um, I, I used to use acrylic paint in my first year because that's, that's the only paint I knew how to use at the time. So when you're in high school, chances are you don't really get as much, um, to much time to experiment with something like say oil paint or char charcoal because if you go to like a, a public uh, high school they don't have enough funding to um, really let you experiment with a lot of uh, mediums so by the time I got to OCAD in first year I felt like I was really behind in comparison to my peers because a lot of my peers had already had a chance to use all these really cool expensive mediums and I had I had never even opened um, a tube of oil paint yet. So I was I was super stressed out in my first year. So we're gonna go into the work that I've made pretty recently. So you can see that there's a little bit of a jump in between. <laughs> and you might recognize this image a little bit from my first um, drawing from first year as well. So once again, um, I'm really looking at how objects are a reflection of people and how the things that we hold, the things that we wear, the things that we buy are essentially a reflection of ourselves. And I find it, um, I find that a lot of the objects that you see in my room, you see me purchase, those are reflections of me. And I'm looking at these objects for how pretty they are. So these are a pair of kiss eyelashes. And I always found it really funny that I would like to purchase like these fake synthetic hairs and glue it to my eye. And that's basically an extension of myself in that when I wear makeup, when I choose to do these certain things, um, I always felt like it was a choice that I had the privilege to make. Like I had, um, I, I could wake up in the morning um, for 30 minutes and put like my personality on my face. So that's why I always really enjoyed looking at beauty products and uh, makeup and all these sort of things, because I thought like 
I could have a choice in how I look. I could, um, I could be influential in how other people see me. And I think fake eyelashes is such a, a great example of that because there's no one looking at fake eyelashes on a person and thinking, oh, those are real. It's not, um, you know, it's not tricking anyone, but it's still like this very uh, forward choice in that person's appearance. Um, and it also, the, with this work, it kind of shows like me diving into a completely different medium from first year. So once I got into my second year at OCAD, I really became familiar with the oil medium and I really loved it for a lot of the reasons that people hate it. So oil is a, you know, kind of more finicky, it's slow drying, um, it, it takes a long time to mix colors and you have to really work layer by layer, but those are the reasons that I really love it. And for that, re for that like a lot of people hate the medium for the same, same reason. So I, I found that being able to work with all these mediums in first year, find out what I hated, what I liked, what worked for me conceptually for my projects, that was a really huge turning point for the work that I create now. So this work here is called um, Double the Luck. And both of, the, both of these works are um, in part of my thesis project. So with, with this idea, again, of exploring the object. And jewelry is one thing that I don't think people realize can be so culturally and religiously significant. And this is a work that I did of like one of my cousins, actually. And I also was looking a lot at the concept of value. So looking at what value in objects mean, because there, there's like physical value, there's value that um, has to do with a price tag, and there's also personal value and how you treasure things. With this, I find that looking at things like jewelry and gold and precious, precious materials, you would think that someone who treasures um, something like gold or jade or like very expensive stones is a person who's maybe very self-centered, very shallow, but gold for a lot of cultures is actually very culturally significant because gold is supposed to represent luck. It's supposed to represent wealth. It also represents a connection to your family. So with my cousin, he actually wears two of these gold jade necklaces because he thinks they'll give him twice the luck. He thinks that if he wears both of them and both of these necklaces were blessed by a temple, um, he thinks that he'll be able to carry as much luck around with him as possible. And it's something that he has in connection with his grandmother because she's a very religious Buddhist woman. She always wants to make sure that he's, um, he's safe from, from ghosts. Um, she won't let him walk into certain places because she's scared that he'll be cursed. Um, he's not allowed to go out at certain times of the day because there's fear that he'll come back with like bad, with like a bad omen. So his family is actually a lot more um, religious and in that that's reflected in the jewelry that he wears but a lot of people think that he wears the jewelry because he's a show-off um, because he's just some dude who likes to look really flashy but so I find that really interesting that the way that you perceive yourself and the way that other people perceive you can be two completely different things and um, I think Claire kind of explores that a little bit in her work too because she's looking a lot at the, the gaze like the western gaze and the eastern gaze And this work right here is also done in oil. And this was the one that I used for the promo images for this event. And once again, I'm kind of revisiting the, the fake eyelashes, but I wanted to look at something a little bit different. So how can the human experience be shown in an object just by besides owning the object and displaying it? And one thing about fake eyelashes and jewelry and clothes is that they look different after a person wears it. They look different after a person has touched it. And these lashes are called after prom because this is actually a painting of my after prom lashes. So you can kind of see what happened to me that night. Um, they don't look great. It's, it's very much a recording of the events of the night. So what kind of person would take a pair of fake eyelashes and try to stick them back in a box and also fail? And that's a, that's, that's a beautiful like, portrait of the kind of person I was when I was 18 years old, you know? Like I wasn't, I wasn't exactly neat, I wasn't tidy, um, but it's very interesting to see 
what happened. And you can see that one of the lashes looks very interesting in that it's not sticking to the plastic at all. And it looks like it's almost about to fall off, which which is what it happened, right? And it's so interesting that um, you can really look at this work and you can see and you can kind of guess what kind of person we were. You can kind of assume, oh, this is um, this is a person that wore fake eyelashes, but something clearly happened. You know, was she crying? Was she drunk? Was it a combination of both? You know, how many times did she wear it? I only wore it once, by the way. And it's just, it's just really, it's really cool that we don't even have to look at a picture of a person. We don't have to see a video of a person. We don't have to talk to a person and we can still figure out a lot of them just by first impressions. And this work right here is, it's probably one of my most favorite pieces that I created for thesis. And it's called, it's hard work being the best. And um, this is, I not only really love this painting that I spent a lot of time on, but I also really wanted to title it that because it's a phrase that I felt like I have said randomly here and there to my friends, just more so as a joke. But I've always uh, been kind of confused and, um, and unsure about my, my placement in the world. And this is something that kind of goes through me and Maria and Claire's work, which is like this, this self-awareness that we are perceived a certain way because we're, we're Asian, we're woman, and we kind of have to deal with the combination of the two. So a lot, a lot of times the way we look at ourselves in the mirror, the way that we know ourselves, our own personalities, our values, is not always reflected in the ways that other people see us. And that can be really complicated because um, there is a really long history of the, the fetishization of Asian women. Um, there's a really long history of Asian people and their perception in North America as well. And that has been something that has impacted my thinking a lot throughout my life that I wasn't really able to pinpoint for such a long time. And it also has a lot to do with like the Asian minority myth. It has a lot to do with the way that our communities have a tendency to handle um, handle things that happen to us, even if they're bad experiences. So with this one, I with this work, I was thinking a lot about the way that Asian culture can be so beautiful, but the beauty oftentimes it covers up a lot of the things that we're going through. Um, we sometimes use it as a co coping mechanism. You sometimes use it as a way out. And this is oftentimes reflected even in Chinatown. When you look at the way Chinatown has almost done like this um, self-orientalizing um, show to make money to survive, right? And with this statue, it looks like a huge gold statue. But it's obviously not made out of real gold, um, but it's attempting to cosplay as if it is. It, it, it's acting like it's actually worth this amount of gold. It's acting as if it's actually really, really, really expensive when it's not. And it's also fascinating how this idea of wealth and value can intersect so much with religion because the Buddhist religion is, is very, you know, very insistent on you living a very simple life. You know, you live for others, you live simply, you don't spend a lot of money, you aren't, um, you aren't jealous of others, you aren't um, striving for something that you can't actually have. But then the statue being made completely out of gold is the complete opposite of that. So I find it so um, difficult to navigate that, especially when I was younger, because religion and culture are two separate things. But when you're a young person, you assume that they're the same thing. So you kind of have no idea how to um, live your life if you were attempting to follow both your religion and both your culture and also be a person of color in North America. So I kind of wanted to go into my work process a little bit just to let you guys see like how it looks when I paint. And this is something like this is a place where I would like want Maria and Claire to kind of <laughs> chime in as well, because they've both seen me in the studios and they also have a similar working process to me in that we plan our works, but we don't we don't really sketch out any of our works at all. So all of us have one sketchbook from first year and it's still the same sketchbook that we use now. 
because most of us actually don't really um, take the time to do little studies of our work. We prefer to write out our ideas using pencil and then you know, implement the idea onto a final painting or final project. And with oil painting, it's pretty traditional to do like a layer of mineral spirits um, on your when you first start painting because it makes it easier um, and it also makes the canvas not white. So I know that helps out a lot of students and a lot of artists, but for myself, I actually don't mind the white background that much. I kind of just go in and outline with a very thin layer of oil paint and I start from the back to the front and then that's how I kind of finish the painting. So I do like a lot of layers of oil, but I don't necessarily go a lot with the traditional underpainting that I think other, other artists might do. I just want to jump in really quick that there is this really academic notion that OCAD pushes of what a sketchbook should look like. And I think it's kind of been also supplemented by like Instagram culture where people would post like really beautiful sketches in their sketchbook. But a lot of my, like um, in first year, a lot of my work had to be thought out through the sketchbook and the curriculum has like these set guidelines of what your sketchbook should look like and have these beautiful process work and thought out notes. And I couldn't do that. Like I couldn't create um, in that linear fashion. And what I ended up doing was I would create my painting, go back to my sketchbook and then sketch what I, my final work like backwards because I had to complete the assignment requirements, but I couldn't create work that was true to myself in like this, this linear fashion that the school is kind of enforcing. So I also I still do that. that. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, it's something that they really push in first year. But I think in my thesis, though, um, there's other forms that a sketchbook can take. And that can be like journaling, it can be a Pinterest board, a Spotify playlist. I think almost literally anything you can claim as a sketchbook. And that's what I've done for my thesis. Like I claim process work as maybe like a walk in the park. Um, I don't know, like citing my Pinterest board. I think all of those things are valid and allowed in an academic context. Anyways, keep going, Hal. I, yeah, I, I would love to just emphasize that the work process for every individual artist is completely different from one another. And I would think that first year at OCAD, like I would hope that they kind of open up that more. But when you're in high school, when you're looking at Instagram, um, they make such a strong emphasis on the sketchbook being so important where you'll open a sketchbook and it's just these beautiful sketches that are done in graphite and they're stunning and well rendered. But um, that never really worked for me. That never really worked for me or Claire because I find that if I think out my ideas too much in that kind of image making, by the time I'm done that sketch, I'm already bored with the idea. I would like to just get started on the painting, right? A so lot of times my- Your work instead of, I don't know, your sketchbook. Yeah, a lot of times my notes, um, just having one sentence is enough for me to create a work. Um, just having a, a rough reference image is enough for me to get started. And if I work on it too long, then I, I will end up getting bored of the idea. And that's something that a lot of our peers and thesis had to go through because they found that if they worked on a on a painting for one month, by the time they finished the painting, they didn't like it anymore. So they had to rearrange the way that they thought about their ideas, the way that they worked on their final projects because they wanted to love and be proud of their work by the time they were finished, right? So you kind of have to take that into consideration as you start plotting down your ideas for your work. This is actually not, truly a work process, but it, it was actually from an assignment that I did in, in second year. So I took a watercolor class in second year. So I was trying to get into mediums that I really enjoyed. And watercolor is a medium that I really, really love. And I had very, you know, boring ideas of what watercolor was before I took this course. So I thought watercolor was only for like landscapes and painting very cute flowers and things like that. And then I took this course with a my prof was named Tristram Lansdowne. And once I was able to view his work, I, I saw watercolor in a completely different light because he used he utilized it in such a specific way that I found was to the advantage of the medium. So I always really looked towards artists who, 
who took the medium and like they just went for it they just used it to the fullest of its potential and that was exactly what he did and for one of my final projects in this class i was thinking a lot about um what kind of future works i'm going to make so i proposed that i would make a fake catalog of my work of my future works to see what kind of works i would actually make in the future and how different they would look from works i've made in the past so this catalog um it has tiny little thumbnail um, watercolor drawings of paintings I thought I would make. And half of these paintings actually ended up being works that I made and then half of them didn't because a lot of the ideas that I had um, changed. A lot of the things that I were interested in have shifted. So it's just really interesting to go back and see, oh, what did I think my career or my art practice was gonna look like two years ago? And there's still a lot of similar ideas, but at the same time, there are things that I completely abandoned and never really looked at. And I think this might be a really interesting way of working for younger students, like just predicting what you might make is really interesting. Like what kind of works do you think you'll make in two years with the skill level that you have in two years? What kind of works do you think you'll make six months from now? And you can be completely wrong, but it also really does show you how you change um, as the years go through. So just, I don't know. I think recording your ideas in a very calculated way sometimes or predicting what your work will look like can be really, really helpful. And um, this is also a part of my work process that I share with Claire. So we talked about Pinterest boards. We talked about writing our ideas down. We talked about really simple um, formats of work process. So for myself, I collect a lot of photo references and I just put them into an album on my iPhone. And I will go through and I'll look at these images. I'll see how do these images relate? Um, which one of these images could I see in a painting? And most of these images are pictures that I take or they're images that I might um, you know, take off of Instagram, off of Twitter. Um, sometimes they're screenshots from other people. Sometimes they're photos of me and my friends zoomed in. And I actually shared this um, this album with Claire. So she could see the pictures that I was adding to this album and she had an album herself and I could see what images she was adding. And it's really cool to see the relation between the first image to the last image. And it really um, allows me to put all of my ideas in one place, but also not have them be so narrow at the same time. Um, you could even see that there's one one image here, and it's a picture of a person holding a bottle of soju. That's me, I'm holding that bottle of soju. I was taking that picture um, at a party and um, because um, someone thought it was really funny that it happened to match my shirt. And then I just like zoomed in and I was thinking a lot about um, how alcohol, like the, the alcohol bottles are actually oftentimes very beautiful to look at. And they're supposed to be beautiful because um, Consumers are attracted to beautiful things. We're more likely to buy something if we think it's pretty, right? Um, and even here, there's a Hennessy bottle next to a board. So I found that to be very fascinating because they're the same shape um, and they're both drinking vessels. But one thing like a gourd is very different than a bottle of Hennessy when we think about it. And there's a screenshot here from a TikTok of a, of a lovely girl hitting a plushie of Hello Kitty because she was upset about finding out that Hello Kitty was used as a way to cover up a lot of Japan's war crimes. So just having all of this together for me, I found was really, really helpful in my work process. And I would encourage any, any, um, any young student who has a phone or a computer or a device to, you know, just put your references all in one place because you might not utilize all of them, but it's really cool to see how they all fit in together. Right, because even with looking at all these random pictures, I, there's already a color palette that's kind of going on and that will later on reflect into our work. So we're gonna go into meeting Maria. Hi, um, okay, uh, I'm in DPX City, I'm in fourth year, but I'm extending my my thesis to next year. Um, so thematically, a lot of my works consist of ambient animated illustrations for the purpose of constructing spaces of peace and self-healing. Aside from this, I also enjoy storytelling and cleaning works inspired by internet culture. That said, while working in various digital mediums such as digital painting, 2D animation, 3D animation, and augmented reality, I aim to explore the integration of 2D and 3D as well as traditional and digital. So 
for the future, um, conceptually, I've kind of I've kind of moved away from like creating artworks based on concept. I'm just because I I want to work in the industry, um, along, alongside other artists in a animation studio, right? So I I've been trying to like perfect my technical skills in understanding these interfaces, um, as, since I didn't really know how to use any of them. And we'll go into one of her works from first year. <laughs> I don't want to see. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. So basically I, I came into like OCAD really not knowing anything about animation. I came, I came from a STEM school and honestly, looking back at this work, I have no idea how I got in, but like these were like exercises, right? So I didn't put in that much effort. So this is like an exaggeration of my first work, I guess. Um, yeah, this was just like a, a jump cycle. You can tell like just the pacing is terrible. <laughs> the, the drawing is terrible. Just everything is terrible about this, but it's an exercise. So I didn't like put in that much effort. I think this is just interesting because we'll see like a movement um, based work later on, like one of your more recent pieces. So we can really see the jump in between this one and that one. <laughs> yeah, the jump, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so once again like I really came in not knowing how to do anything at all um this is my this was my first time using Maya this was also an exercise just in class um I didn't this was my first time trying to use it and I had we had to make a face right and yeah <laughs> this was my my, my project <laughs> um uh and I've, I feel like I've improved much more since since um this class. This was like the uh, 3D animation class from I think second year. Yeah. And then now we're gonna go into her more recent works. <laughs> the jump, oh my God. So I, um, going into like second and third year, <laughs> thanks guys. Um, going into second and third year, I realized like um, I really did not like, um, Frame by frame animation where you're drawing like every single frame. I enjoyed computer based animation, which is what 3D animation is, and also After Effects. So this was just um, a practice walk cycle um, where we just yeah we just have to make a walk cycle right. But I decided I decided to add like a little story to it just to make it a bit more fun for me. So it's basically about a forest spirit who um, basically disappears from existence once her forest becomes uh, deforested. I guess yeah. And this, these are all just short clips of my animation since it's kind of hard to show like the actual full animation through PowerPoint. Yeah, um, Maria has a YouTube channel actually that um, shows like the full of these animations. And she does have one animation that I think has like almost 400,000 views on it, of, which is like a, she did of, of No Face from Spirited Away. So if you guys wanna check it out, I, I would totally recommend to check out her YouTube channel. Thank you for the shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one was a mixed media um, AR thing. And it's a shame that I can't really show you like the, the actual AR in, in work, I guess. So um, yeah, this was just done in, this was done in like a multitude of mediums, which I'll show you later. Um, and it's just basically, it plays on the idea of like um, a lot of my works in third year, I believe, was like um, based on self healing uh, from like familial like trauma, <laughs> and um, yeah. So growing up really broke, like uh, I had to rely on my imagination a lot to like have fun. So it just that it really just plays on that idea. And I think you can kind of see that there's like a color palette that is starting to follow in her works. And that's something that I think in, in fourth year we start to do where all of our works start to connect with one another thematically and also um, appearance wise as well, which is what we weren't able to do in our early years. Like in, in my first year, if you looked at two of my works side by side, you wouldn't, you would have no idea what they were actually like in relation to. But just going from one slide to the next, like Maria has like a very similar color palette that she follows in her work. Yes. You see a distinct style beginning to form. 
Um, so this was, uh, this is a snippet of my third year final animation. Um, even though I, this one, cause the sketching and planning process is so important in DPXA, you really can't slack, but like, I find that my works that are spontaneous are my best works. This one was a bit more planned. So it, and I, I don't really like how it turned out, but I found through this project, I found out I really enjoy like background and like, um, settings and I, I, I that's what I enjoy and that's what I kind of want to do in the future and yeah and then we'll go into the next work whoops I don't Is know it? if that's playing <laughs> I can't tell if it's playing it's not playing for me okay give me one second I don't know why it's being spoiled. okay uh so basically um this year I've been trying to explore like with augmented reality since finding it out in the first um in my third year right so this was made this is my first time using like um unity uh at all so I had a really fun time learning about that and this it's what I want to do for thesis now um yeah I was kind of afraid of taking this class because I kind of strayed away from 3d for a while um but yeah I really recommend like taking classes that you're like going out of your comfort zone and like exploring me different mediums because you'll never know what you, you'll find and what you will enjoy. So this was just an exercise with, um, um, yeah, M Maya and Unity where I modeled the model and animated the figure and then transferred it into uh, augmented reality app. This is probably one of my favorite um, pieces of yours. Um, I know you can't like see it with the other ones as much, but a lot of Maria's work is very funny and also very cute at the same time like it like the first time you look at it you're you're like what the heck is this um but it's really like it's also really adorable that you made a devil look like this <laughs> you know and then we yeah. can go more so into the work process yeah once again like as how said like we don't really <laughs> do much sketching. All my sketching recently has been done in Photoshop, but like, the best thing about like digital art is that you sketch and then you immediately jump into the work. Um, you don't really focus too much on that, but um, yeah, this is just uh, my work progress photos of like the planning of like that walk cycle that I did before. It was like really quickly done. And um, would, how long would you say that your, your sketches take for? Maybe th um, 30 minutes, I guess. I just need to get down to like the, the character design and color palette and I'm good to go. Yeah, so as you can see, like <laughs> all this is um this is gonna be like the work process of my um what's it called childhood Im imagination project. This is um in my sketchbook from that assignment. Like as you can see, like a lot of my sketchbook notes are all my pages are just basically notes of like ideas and like possible um, art projects that I can do. Then I, I usually do stick figures, but this one was a bit more rendered just because I needed it to show something for the, um, the assignment itself. And so basically this is just showing the initial sketch to the analog watercolor and acrylic painting that I did because this project was very hybrid. But I realized like through this paint, like through this assignment that I really, really suck at painting. I, I hate painting. So I had to Photoshop that like the hell out of it in the next slide you can see. Yeah, <laughs> the face is very, very different. So um, the first, the top image is just me Photoshopping in uh, um, Photoshop. Then the other image is just animating all the assets in After Effects. And this was just doing um, the AR aspect in Artify, which I really recommend for you if you want to um, have experience in Artify. So yeah, after the last assignment, I realized how much I sucked at painting, and I I was kind of scared to like go back into painting, but I painting, but I knew that if I wanted to integrate um, traditional and digital art, I had to get better. So I really pushed myself to like do. Um, <laughs> Uh, take a painting class so this was just like a difference within once um one year one year the first one was the first semester then the second painting was a second semester and I feel like I got much better like 
to that just yeah so good yeah thank you it was just really really bad like I remember for like, my first critique like the class was laughing <laughs> like at the painting <laughs> no. but like I was laughing with them so it didn't hurt my feelings <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know um for some of you you guys haven't had the experience of a, a critique live in person yet and your first critique in person is is very oh, so hard it's really hard but it teaches you a lot it also humbles you quite a bit you know yes. you, you really think that you're something until you get up there and the whole class has a say of what your work looks like but it's very very helpful and you can see like there's such a huge jump in between like your skills as a painter and I also I, I really um admire that you mentioned that you took painting courses even though you know you're not the best at painting and it's not exactly what you explore all the time in your work I think sometimes taking the jump of taking one course that you know you know you might not do that well in and you might not enjoy it but you will get a lot of um, experience and um, progress in, in a specific medium or style can be really helpful just because it points you in a very specific direction like do you want to continue in it or do you want to just stray away like I took a printmaking class once in my second year and I'm very bad at printmaking but it kind of just showed me that um how how I can utilize printmaking in my practice if I if I chose to right how it would translate a lot differently um in comparison to say an oil painting okay and then it's obviously go. very rewarding and you got great results yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now we'll we'll meet Claire. Yeah. So um, just like how I'm a fourth year thesis student um, in drawing and painting, uh, my artistic practice challenges and reclaims stereotypes of Chinese women and their sexuality by investigating a visual fetishism fueled by the gaze. This is supplemented by personal research into diasporic culture. Oil paintings and food-based sculpture rooted in identity and the sentimental help redefine visions of post-colonialism through the confrontation of victimization with an unwavering stare, defiant and unafraid. And then we'll keep going. Oh. So um, I, I ended my first year with this self-portrait. So um, by the end of your second semester, um, your painting course, you have to do a self-portrait that's life size. So this is three and a half by four and a half feet. Um, I really struggled afterwards with this because I felt like this was like the height of my career in first year and I was like, there's no going back. And I really struggled with meeting the expectations that I set so high for myself. And I think it was because um, when I started this course at the beginning of the semester, uh, the prof, I had Eileen at the time, who is now the chair, uh, she gave a presentation about the projects and I had this vision in my mind and I wanted to carry that out. And I did exactly as I planned. I started like way ahead of time and I jumped right into it because I was so passionate about getting this done. This was like probably one of the first pieces where I was given like artistic freedom because up until then in first year, I was doing very technical work and everybody in the class was painting the exact same thing, like the same still life. Uh, you all did like black and white studies, like different colors studies, things like that. So, um, I really like put everything into it and came out with something that I was really proud of. Um, also, this was the first time that I was experimenting with themes of identity and what it means to be an Asian woman. Um, and also my first time looking into ceramics. I was just originally fascinated with the idea of the patterning on porcelain and I just threw it in this painting as a halo. Um, but I think that also opened up a new route um, of discovery where I started to research why I did that. Even though this was a gut feeling, it opened up a whole new, I guess, road of self-discovery and um, art history for me. Um, with Claire's work, like, 
in our first year, I knew Claire's work before I even knew who she was because her work was on <laughs> as part of the as part of like the first year um, exhibition. So I don't know if that happened this year, obviously with the COVID situation, but traditionally they have a first year show of like um, your best work if you submit it and her work was up in like the second floor and I remember thinking like oh my god like how can anyone like yeah. our age make work that's so good and it was also interesting to become friends with Claire later on and see her ideas and how it developed into this work and how she had to um, also create works after this piece because sometimes you'll create a work that you think is good and you'll say I'll never top this one don't throw there'll be nothing that's ever better than that. And that can be really stunting to you because you're always going to end up being disappointed in future works. But um, there's there are ways to get past that. And that has a lot to do with progress, learning, research, and developing your practice. And I'm also sure that you guys, there's a lot of work that you do in first year that's super boring. It, it is, right? But you, a lot of it helps you skill-wise in developing um, your your early drawing and painting and design skills. Um, everyone from our year, so 2017, we all painted um, acrylic uh, paper bags. Like, I don't know if that was something that you guys did in your first year. Well, everyone in that year, we all had the same boring um, acrylic paintings of paper bags in our class. And then every the year after that, they might have painted something different. But it's just all the same boring crap that you and your peers had to go through. But it's it's a nice relationship to share with the person next to you that you have the exact same assignment um, underneath your bed or in your closet. I also want to add that I think around that time in first year, one of my profs or somebody, someone of authority said to us that you're only going to make one good work every five years. And that like blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God, I'm never going to make good work again. I have to wait until what like after I graduate till I make something good again and I was like freaking out but obviously they lied because uh not true okay it's there's no specific timeline or artistic process of what you're gonna make and how good it's gonna be so we're gonna move on into some more of her recent work and there's a very clear relationship between the two mm-hmm so as I said earlier, I used that plate as a halo and I didn't really know what I was doing until I started taking art history courses. And I was really fascinated by these, uh, the use of ceramics and the history of them. So I started incorporating them into my paintings even more. Um, and I discovered like by coincidence, I was like mind blown that um, there were these Italian painters during the Renaissance who would appropriate ceramics from all over the world and use them as halos in religious paintings. So that's where um, these three work out of like the entire series that I created stems from. Um, I was looking at the way that they would appropriate ceramics from the quote unquote East and then using that because their assumption that because it's from the East, it must be holy. And then associating that with biblical characters. So I created these, um, what I call modern Madonnas. So contemporary figures in poses that you would see in those same paintings that those Italian artists were creating. And then I, at the same time, I was collecting ceramics or starting to, and then I smashed them and then use the actual ceramics as found objects in my paintings. Um, and these were also created uh, when I was living in Florence. So I was part of the Florence program that OCAD runs or used to run. I don't know if they're gonna run it anymore, but it's open to third and fourth years. And if you ever have the chance to sign up, I highly recommend it, um, especially for an art history nerd like myself. You're learning about the paintings and seeing them in person rather than on a PowerPoint in the lecture hall. So it was really eye-opening and you were able to use uh, the studio that the school provided and come in any hour of the day and work on your uh, pieces that were also in relation to what you were studying. I um, These works like 
I always liked, I know that you received a lot of really good feedback with the, the middle one, the largest one, even though you said that you spent the least amount of time on that work in comparison to the other two. So it's just interesting how like um, with the first work that you had, it's very clear that you have um, background already in representational skills and oil painting skills that you, you described it almost as your painting looking airbrushed, right? Um, like, like perfect. But with these ones, there's like a, a level of roughness to it that exists that is really interesting. Even with like your paint strokes are a little bit um, less, um, they're defined in a way that isn't realistic as well. Um, you show the underpainting in the middle work a little bit, like there's that bright pop of, um, of color underneath that kind of shines through. It's just interesting to see how like you already had a lot of your skills and ideas like down, but you you still had to develop them further somehow. Right. So I think uh, compared to my first year work, I was like working and overworking everything until it was perfect. So it took me so long to achieve that final product that I worked over the couple months of the semester. But with these works, um, as well as I think there's there's two others that I did during this time frame, I had to complete during the three months that I was given studio access. So I'm kind of like learning shortcuts at the same time uh, in my painting process. Um, and just quickly, like in the middle one, quickly brushing in, I guess, signifiers of light and shadow to create an image rather than overworking so many times that it's become this like smooth airbrushed surface. And I don't have time for that because I got things to do, other classes to attend. So like the, the middle painting here, like the painting part, I, the figure I probably did in a day because I didn't have time for anything else. I had to ship these works out, like give them time to dry and ship them out back to Canada um, for when I move back to Toronto. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of uh, process learning, painting learning as an artist. Uh, but that's OCAD also teaches you how to paint really fast, especially if you're an oil painter. Like some of the work that we created, we, we had to really um, we had to really spend a lot of time on it, but we had to do it in a very short amount of days. So you would you would basically pick and prioritize which painting am I going to do the best in? Which one am I going to rush? What assignments am I going to have to um, stay up all night to work on? And when we show up to critique, all of our paintings are still wet. <laughs> so oftentimes our works are just finished the minute, literally the minute before class starts. And um, that's, that's something that I wish I didn't do as much when I was younger, but that, that was what we went through in terms of like organizing our time and taking a lot of um, studio courses. Um. <laughs> but if you do need an extension, like you should reach out to your prof or reach out to the student wellness center who can uh, or I don't know if they're still called SAS, but student accessibility services that can ensure that you get the extensions that you need if you're really struggling. And um, yeah, I would I would say especially because many of you will be taking school um, next semester and it will be remote learning most likely for the summer and the fall. Um, there are a lot of circumstances that have to do with COVID right now that professors usually are, are very open to hearing. Um, if you need an extension, like don't don't be afraid to ask for it. Like I've asked for it like a lot in the past, yeah. and a lot of my professors have been really nice enough to um, just give out extensions without asking. So I had a professor um, who just said, just hand in your assignments whenever you want, and if you can't make it before the end of the semester, just email me. Like. That was what he was willing to do to ensure like the success of his class. Which there is very are loopholes. There are loopholes to their grading system. And if you're nice to them, they will accommodate you. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's go into the next work. Okay, so this is part of my thesis. Um, what I was getting into was that I don't really have a space in my 460 square foot apartment to make big work that I wanted to. So I adapted and started looking into sculpture and expanded painting. So 
here I have uh, actual pepper that I painted to match uh, the, the porcelain counterpart that's beside it. And I think this is a real jump in my practice where I've stepped away from a very traditional Western canon of painting and the techniques that I've been taught since first year and applying that into a more conceptually based practice. Um, I always, I really like this work and I know like most of our, our peers do and I was so surprised with your thesis work in terms of how experimental you were going with it. Um, Cause I thought you were gonna do like five paintings for your, like five large paintings for your thesis work. Cause you're always really good at that. And then you like stepped back and you took one part of your earlier work and you really expanded on it, which was um, this like, like more physical pieces um, you know, references that are part of the work as well. And just the fact that like every Asian person can look at this teapot and be like, yeah, I recognize it. We don't have to own it. Almost every family will own one <laughs> of these or a version of these. And then let's go into the next one. So here's another rendition where I painted on a piece of ginger with another porcelain piece that I've collected. So ever since my time in Florence, I would say I've been trying to collect as much as I can. And I would call it research for my practice. So when I was in Florence, they had these really great like secondhand markets where they would sell little trinkets for super cheap. And I would go like almost every week and get as much as I can. But of course I couldn't bring it all home back to Toronto because, you know, shipping, I can't fit it all in my luggage and they're, even if I like smash them up and save them, which I do have a small bag of them, like I couldn't bring it all back. So when I was back in Toronto, I tried to collect as much as I could. Um, I have some like family heirlooms as well as pieces that I've bought just walking through Chinatown, like this piece here, I bought for probably like five bucks at a store. Um. You, I also would like to mention that um, you photographed like these two works really well. <laughs> and that's, that's hard to do in a remote setting sometimes. And one of the advantages of going to OCAD is that you're in these studios with like good lighting and like white backgrounds. So I, can, I know it probably was a struggle for some of you guys who were in your first year to photograph your works and upload them, but we can always talk about that more a little bit later. Mm -hmm. I have no experience in photography, so this was like a huge challenge for me. I was on the phone with my cousin who is a photographer, not a professional photographer, but as a hobby, and he was like walking me through steps of how to like photograph, how to set up my camera and do all these things. Um, I think if we were in person, one of the greatest things would be talking to the uh, help desk that also rents like DSLRs and different um rental equipment that can help you to photograph your um your paintings or your sculptural work uh yeah um this painting okay maybe i did lie a little bit because i did do a painting in my apartment so this is part of my thesis where i miss painting so much that i had to do it um and part of me uh that had to give in to the limitations of the pandemic was to switch over to water-based oils because I was putting my health at risk for using regular oil paints in an apartment that is stuffy, doesn't have good ventilation um, or the proper infrastructure that OCAD has in their studios. So it's still not a good thing for me to be using water-based oils because it still has the same properties as oils, but I made that jump um, to change materials just to satisfy that need to paint. Um, this isn't as specific, I guess, because Miriam mainly works digitally. She doesn't, you know, you don't have to think so much about the safety of your tools, but we did have to transition our practices a little bit, um, especially with certain mediums because definitely <laughs> for DPXA, like you have to have a 
a really good computer setup if you want to do like 3D. And one of the advantages of like being in school was like the render farm because rendering like takes hours, sometimes days. Um, if you're rendering on one computer, but with the render farm, it takes like a couple a couple hours, right? And that's why I had to like upgrade my my whole computer setup at home because it just could not work on anything properly um, with my old my old PC. Yeah, and um, with myself and Claire being an oil painter, they do advise you to not use oil paint so much at home if you if you can choose to because it's not. It's not a medium that you kind of want to be breathing or, you know, mm -hmm. ingesting. It's not, it's not great for you health wise. Right. And that's also why I don't really use mineral spirits um, that much unless I'm cleaning my brushes, but I try to use oil because mineral spirits is like, it's a very strong scent. And also it's not very good for you to breathe in. There's a lot of mediums that um, are dangerous for you to use without proper ventilation, like resin, resin art being one of them. That's a huge one. Right. And a lot of times with like, um, I'll meet younger students who are just transitioning out of high school. They had no idea, right? Because they, they were used to doing like certain work in school and they assumed that they can continue that work at home. And that's not exactly the case. And having a studio practice, there are even simple things such as like the way you sit when you do your work, it can really affect your health. Um, I, I remember I met a student once who told me that she did all of her paintings on the floor. So she was really hurting her back. And I, was like, why don't you <laughs> and I was like, why don't you just do it on a table? Like, why don't you just prop it up on a table? And if you don't have an easel, like prop it up on a box. And it made me like very concerned for like um, first year students who have never had like that proper um, studio uh, introduction, which is something that when me and Maria and Claire were in school, they spend like a whole day teaching you how to be in the studio, what you can do, what you can't do, where you, where you can put stuff away, where you would sit and do your work, right? And unfortunately for some of you guys, you guys had to figure that out on your own, which is really, really tough to do. I think a great, or maybe a bad, or an example, I'm not gonna say whether it's good or bad is, but your profs, they've been teaching and, wor and working in their own studios for however many years. And a lot of them have developed like allergic reactions to the solvents or the paints that they used to use and that students use now and you'll find sometimes that um your props will have to leave the class to get i guess a breath of fresh air and take a break because if they're teaching back-to-back -back classes every day or a semester after semester for years around this kind of stuff like it's very detrimental to your health so i would advise that you pay attention to like the work safety stuff that they uh, advertise and try to promote in the studios and you can probably access that somewhere on the OCAD website. Mm -hmm. Yeah I would just you know make sure you take breaks. Sometimes I'll be doing a painting for hours and realize that I'm really delirious like I'll I'm kind of yeah, light -hearted. from the paints. Yeah and like I'll I'll be texting things that like don't necessarily make sense. And I'll realize like, oh, that's, that's not good for me at all. And you should really like time, time your breaks, take five minute breaks, go out for a walk, get a drink of water. At OCAD, normally we would get like a, like we would have these six hour studio courses and they would tell you to take a break, like literally go outside because it's not good for you to be cooped up with like these mediums all day, right? Um, so it's, that's something that I, I really hope that you guys are aware of because I want you to make it to your second year. <laughs> Right. Make it to your second year. Oh no. Like I hope. Um, like if you use resin, please wear a mask. Like those sort of things. Like it's very, very, um, it's very, very unsafe if you don't um, pay attention to those sort of rules. Okay. And then this is your work process. Mm -hmm. So part of my process again is collecting images and the painting that you saw earlier is based off of this image. So I discovered this randomly, I couldn't find any history of where this image comes from, but I can deduce from my art history toolbox of skills that this this is a modern rendition of a Yukio Japanese print. And obviously there's an Asian woman who's looking pretty shy and submissive about the position she's in. So the idea of that painting that was on the previous slide is to subvert that and give her agency um, give her some power over the pose that 
she chose herself to put um, to squat and uh, look directly at the viewer um, in the idea of the gaze. So the gaze I'm referring to is uh, an example of Olympia, Manet's Olympia, um, where the woman is looking back at the viewer and challenging the viewer. And a lot of my practice is how can I uh, bring back the gaze, whether it's through, challenge the gaze through a subject, like a person, or maybe it's through my food produce, um, which I think are also stand in for bodies as well. So here's some, a look into the studio life of when I was in Florence. Um, and as you can see, we had the great privilege of having a beautiful studio space that I shared with two other students in the class. Coincidentally, both the other students were DPXA students. So I got to take up like a majority of the room because their work was digital. Um, I also encourage those who aren't in the drawing and painting program to apply because we also had like a photography student, a sculptural student and a curatorial student in the program as well. Um, this, this program, I hope it will be offered in the future for some of you, but clearly right now that, that can't be the case um, for this year and the upcoming year. But I think just, you know, um, getting a chance to have your own studio is, is really nice, which is something that Claire had to experience. And um, for some of you who have started into maybe your second and third year, you'll start to take courses that um, are more self-directed. They're almost like run practice thesis. Right. So you get like one semester to do your own body of work or you get an assignment where the prompt is completely up to you. And that that goes for DPXA and and DRPT. Um, so that kind of prepares you for your fourth year where you're expected to work on a project for almost a year. Right. And that can be really, really hard. But really honing in what you want to do in your own studio space is something that is very, very um, integral to the art school experience. And a little bit more progress on the squat painting. Um, so I started with the figure, which I knew was what I wanted. Um, I got a friend of mine to pose for me and take photos, not in person uh, due to the pandemic, plus she lives in Montreal, but she posed for me. I painted the figure based on that and then kind of worked in the background based on the original photo that I was referencing. So uh, she was in a landscape and I brought that in through the skyscape in the background, but I didn't want to copy the uh, integration of the floral uh, because I thought it was um, associated too much with the femininity and I wanted to break that natural landscape by adding in the checkered pattern, kind of like a grid almost unnatural, like too unnatural. Um, and also like just the fact that you had this painting up on a wall and you're painting up with it in your apartment, just really interesting to see that part of the studio life as well. Like I work on a really cheap um, uh, easel, like a aluminum one I got from like Michael's when I was like 13. And it's worked for me though, because it's easy and light to move around. But in the schools, we have these huge wooden ones that are super heavy, but they're very reliable. Like it's very unlikely for your works to move um, or shift while you're painting on them. And um, but how about for you, Maria? Like, like when you're at home, how do you try to paint now if you do any traditional painting work? I, I still paint on the floor. <laughs> uh. But I don't paint that much. I'm usually like this year has been all paint, like if I'm in school, but just like I still I've left all my my supplies still at school in the locker. I've yet to pick it up. So uh, this year has really just been um, just on me and my PC and my tablet working there. All my stuff is still in the lockers as well. <laughs> Okay, some more progress of when I was painting the pepper 
and then my setup for photographing it, which was a struggle, um, like <laughs> balancing my cat scratching posts and books so I can get the perfect shot. Um, and then, you know, like not, not moving the camera so it's not blurry. And then afterwards I took it into Photoshop and kind of cleaned it up a bit. Um, let's go. So this is the last part before the break or I mean, after we're done this, we can see if everyone wants to take a break or if you want to just go through, go through it. But I think taking a break would be a good idea. And this section is just between me, Maria and Claire and has a lot to do with our relationships with each other and how um, we as artists have kind of influenced each other, which is why I really wanted them to join me in this workshop because I felt that they know me really well. They know like, they know my work really well and it's the same goes for me knowing them and it's it's really nice to be part of a community of artists a community of people who think like you and I know for remote learning it's a lot harder to do that because you don't get to physically meet your peers and you don't really get to see what they do like from day to day which is something that I had the privilege of seeing Maria do and seeing Claire do right um how did we meet <laughs> So I met Hao in our first year painting class, like one, one of the very first days, right? And I asked, I asked her for an iPhone charger because my, my phone was bad. And, and we just like took off from there, like, yeah. Yeah, um, me meeting Maria, I think it was literally the first week of, of art school. So yeah. we were both still very nervous at the time. And I was very grateful for her talking to me, to be honest, because I didn't have any friends going into OCAD. Like I didn't know anyone at OCAD and I, I still got lost walking around the school all the time. <laughs> so she was really nice in that sometimes if I forgot like a pencil or I forgot to get like a cup to paint with, like she would share it with me. We would sit next to each other in class too. Like it was just so, it was so nice to have someone that was in the same shoes as me and yeah. feeling the same way I was that like I could I could rely on them to to I don't know just be there for me even as like inexperienced as we were and um with meeting Claire I met Claire in my second year technically so we were taking a studio course by um run by a professor named JG Lee who's really great if you guys ever get a chance to take her class it would be really cool um, and it was uh, it was actually an identity based course, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, the course had a lot more to do with our creative ideas and how our work related to our identity. And I think Claire, she sat next to me at one of the easels. And I remember she made like a, a joke about some artist that someone had brought up. And I was like, oh, I really like this person. <laughs> and then afterwards, we kind of hanging out. And then the three of us had a class together in second year. We took, um, it was art a history. mixed class, the modern art history yeah. class. Yeah. Which is something that you guys will probably all have to take. I was honestly, like, we, were, I was like a menace in that class because <laughs> I had a hard time paying attention um, because that particular professor, she, she, I, I had a hard time just um, paying attention to her voice. So um, we would sit in this like lecture hall, I think on the second floor, and I would just be looking at memes on my computer. Even though I got like fairly decent marks in the in the course, I felt like I couldn't pay attention. And a lot of times, Maria and Claire, who were sitting next to me, and also um, one of our other friends, Zeb, who who joined us as well, nice. like. Um, I would just start laughing in the middle of lectures, which is very unprofessional and super bad, but I couldn't help it. And most of the time the memes had to do with art history, but it was really, it was really nice to be able to take a lot of courses with my friends because we could, you know, get notes from each other, yeah. um, question things together. Like it, it felt nice to not be lonely and to also make friends with people who have the same intentions as you do, right? And everyone who goes to OCAD has very similar intentions, which is you want to develop your skills and your create creative ideas and then put it together to create like an art or design practice. Um, how would you say our practices are similar or different from one another? 
mine is very very different from like you two <laughs> um yeah I think while you guys are are very conceptual based I kind of moved away from that since my third year uh, in my fourth year I'm still trying to like un understand all these new programs like that I need to know for the industry um yeah what about you guys um I would say that like one thing that our practices are similar is that it really focuses a lot on the human experience yeah, that's especially true. like our perceptions of ourselves and also the perceptions of others onto us and that's something that I can relate all, all within our works and that has a lot to do with our personal background and the way that we see our own identities um I would say that Maria's work looks a lot at the past so yeah. at memory at family life and that was something that I had a lot in common with her in the first year because we created a lot of works um kind of based off of like our trauma and um, our, our yeah. family and us growing up and me and her are both like Vietnamese um, and we grew up in, in similar similar ways as well and then with Claire's work I feel like Claire makes a lot of art history references in her work which she states but at the same time she her works kind of point to the future for me in like a new way of thinking um, would you say the same yeah, I would say that a lot of my research stems from, or sorry, my practice stems from my research. So from every art history class that I take, that's where my work is produced. So I have a minor in art history and every semester I take at least one history course. And so what I find helpful was that I would uh, align my studio classes with what I was learning about in those history courses so that all my work would um, my work, my papers, the essays that I were, was writing and the research that I was doing would all coincide and align with each other so that my practice altogether moves as one, I would say one unit in a specific theme that I'm interested in focusing on. So the classes that I took, like for example, um, Art and Globalization with Ryan White who focuses, whose, whose specialty is ceramics, which is why I love him so much. Um, or like Islamic art history, we are given the freedom to write a uh, research paper based on anything under the umbrella topic that we're given. And every time I would do that, I would look into the ceramics under those guidelines that I was interested in. And then that would supplement my practice at the same time. And um, I think, yeah, it's really cool to see how our works are also different at the same time, if, but if we were to put our works thematically in a show together, I find that they would still relate to one another. I think my works kind of point more at the present. So they're exactly how I feel in the moment or my reflections of myself in the moment. So um, the way that you kind of reach out more to references that exist outside of um, your own personal experiences is something I really admire. But I think with my work, I pull a lot out from myself I, my own, the references I use are usually me. Like there are pictures that I take, they're images of myself. So it, it's it's cheaper, honestly, like to be honest, to just use myself as a reference. But it's also like, it makes my work really personal because when I look at my works, I see them as like a, a portrait of who I am. Um, I love that because if you put all of our work together, the differences are so strong in that the Asian experience is not a monolith we are, you know, we may identify as, say, Asian or Canadian American, but there's so much more to that, that you can see through our art. And the differences are so strong, but still connected in similarities. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, I think sometimes, especially with artists who are, who identify as marginalized. So if you're a person of color, um, if you're disabled, um, if you're part of the, if, if you identify as queer, a lot of the times you, you find that you'll meet another student who identifies in a similar way that you do. And that might be really promising for you. Like you might find a lot of comfort in that. But then I've also heard of like some students finding that difficult because they feel like, oh, then I'm not that unique. Like my ideas are not that interesting because there's too many other people doing the same ideas. Like the thing is that there's like hundreds of artists 
if not yeah. thousands of artists who are talking about being Asian in their work, but we're still creating work that kind of fits into that description anyways, right? I think in like first year, you sort of learn, like you're sort of taught and told by everyone, like nothing is really original. You always pull inspiration from like some, somewhere else, right? You just gotta make it your own somehow. Yeah, and that, that also sort of relates to one of the questions on these pages, which is like, do we ever feel competition in our community? And yeah, <laughs> like we do. And sometimes it's really hard to compete with your friends. It's hard to compete um, and be compared to a class or a year where there's like hundreds of students who are at the same skill level as you are, right? And you guys are all working towards the same opportunities. Like me and Claire are in the same program. And sometimes the opportunities that we're offered or the ones that we seek, they're offered to like thousands of people at once. And we, we have to apply for them and we have to just hope that we'll be considered. And it can be really hard when your friend wins something that you really wanted and you know you didn't get, or an opportunity that you thought was perfect for you is given to somebody else. And it's also really particular to someone who who, who feels like marginalized. Like there are certain opportunities that are only given, which is great, that are only given to certain communities. Like there'll be like a scholarship that's only for emerging black artists or a grant that's only given to disabled students. Like it's a very, very specific, but sometimes like that sort of tension can um, create like um, a hostile um, environment for students who are you know, similar to other students, like you feel like you'll look at another person of color and have to compete with them for that scholarship or whatever. Yeah, but you also have to acknowledge that like decades ago, these wouldn't have existed. And it's exactly what we need now to help our communities flourish. So even if you're in competition with your peers, I think there's still a just way that you guys can work together and, um, bounce off of each other and create those apply to opportunities work together and don't get too frustrated I guess mm -hmm. and uh um just I guess that that does like relate to one of the other questions which is how are we influenced by each other's like our peers and professors and artists one thing that I've always really loved about like my friends at OCAD and the, the people at OCAD is that we share things with each other like all the time, maybe overwhelmingly so, like yeah. opportunities, um, like here, like apply to this, like I think you fit, like if you see an opportunity that isn't for you, but you can see one of your friends or peers, like fitting into it, like, you, you know, just, just send it to them, right, um, oftentimes, like our peers, even like people we don't know that well, they'll be like, they'll look at our work, and they're like, hey, you should check out this artist, which is so helpful, that's so yeah. great, right, and a lot of the artists that me and Maria and Claire, we like, we collectively like, um, like artists like Winnie Trung, um, Dominique Fung, like a lot of these artists that we discovered on Instagram, we, we will share it with each other because um, we find that, you know, there's a lot of things that we seek for in our work that is similar to these artists who were very successful in their careers. And um, if you guys know any artists who like you really admire or see as like a huge part of your uh, research or practice, like I'd love to see it in the comments. Um, maybe it would be really cool. Um, and even with our professors too, one thing I'd like to mention is that when you guys take your courses and you pick your courses, pick courses with professors that you like. Um, one thing that so I did, practice. yeah, like one thing in second year that I did that was really different from first year was that I took courses and I would pick professors that I had already previously researched. So I saw what their work looked like and that made me feel really good because when I was taking their class, I like admired their practice and I admired them as a person. And you kind of build this relationship with them. Like when you guys say that's the same for you too. Yeah. Yeah. I also choose courses based on what will push my work like thematic. I kind of avoided like very plain and simple classes maybe because it didn't interest me. For example, like if it was a abstract painting class, like I never would have taken that. I mm -hmm. took courses that would push me in here. Like I would take, oh gosh, let's see, like the class with JJ where it pushed your work to have meaning 
based on themes that I wanted to focus on, um, things like that, and maybe like sociology and cultural anthropology courses that were really moving and helped me to push my practice in the way that I wanted to. Yeah, like um, with myself, I felt like I was very weak um, skill-wise. So I took a lot of I took a lot of courses that were like, they, they would be described as workshops. So you'll see like the, the way that they name courses, it'll be, um, it'll tell you a lot about what the course is. So I took one, one course in third and fourth year, which is called like advanced painting workshop, where you would work a lot on your own skills as an artist, not necessarily creative ideas. And then I would take other courses that were only focused on creative ideas. And having both of those um, courses, they really um, became super influential on my practice because I needed to build both of those things together. And even in the comments, like Zeb said, that building relationships with your profs are really important too, because they are a resource. Like there have been so many opportunities that have been pushed our way because of our professors, because they were like, hey, maybe you should apply for this, right? Um, which is which is so nice. And there's, yeah. there's, there isn't that kind of report that exists outside in the world. Um, so building building relationships with your peers and your professors is, is super great. That's like one of the biggest things I can I think we can take away from OCAD. I feel like that's gonna be that's you for grants, um, which is money. So having a good relationship with your prof can sometimes equal um, you getting ben um, ben benefits. Sorry, I right. feel like that's sorry, no, sorry, it's okay. I feel like it's gonna be harder for like over remote learning. Um, like making these connections and relationships. But uh, my, my advice to like uh, newer students uh, is definitely like starting like a, like a Discord group or a chat with your, your classmates in a class just so you can discuss um, like assignments um, and you really build connections over that for, like for me, that's how I made my friends this, this year too. Like I made many new friends over Discord and I'm the, we always share opportunities with each other and it's like a really, I think that's the next best option for remote learning and making connections that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, just the topic of remote learning, which is also on this page, like it's, it's, it's really hard. And I really hope that, I don't know, somehow Ontario pulls, you know, pulls it together. And for the fall semester, magically, like it'll be in person, but right now it's not looking um, like that case. I know for sure this summer, semester is going to be online and hopefully the fall semester could either be hybrid at, at best but remote learning is really hard because in your first year you kind of make all your mistakes with your peers you do all these things in the studios and it it really is super influential into the rest of your your years at OCAD and um not having that is is something that I was really aware of and something that I, I saw a lot of young younger students um struggling with so that's kind of why I wanted to make this workshop in the first place and it, it can really um it can really impact more so people who have practices that require studios like what's what me Maria and Claire are very lucky to have is that we have practices that can be done in a different space like painting and we can easily do it in a room in our house Maria largely does a lot of digital yeah. work on her computer so some people are doing like more sculpture or they're doing installation based work and they're doing work that can't even be photographed um, easily as well, especially if you live in a, maybe you live in a basement apartment, you can't photograph your work that well in the dark. Um, uh, me and Claire, we're lucky to have paintings that photograph pretty easily. Um, and we're able to, we have cameras to take pictures of our work. We have like natural lighting a lot of times to take pictures of our work. And that's something that not everybody has when it comes to doing, you know, doing your practice at home. So I'm, I'm very hyper aware of that. And I, I know like it, it can be really hard if you're in your first year to, to deal with something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, isolation. Isolation is a huge, yeah. huge yeah. one. The biggest um, thing I miss about the studios is just being able to walk over to your friend or your neighbor and just chat about what they're doing or what you're doing like if you're having trouble on like if I'm stuck on a painting I could just go and be like how can you take a look at this please like I'm struggling with this I don't know how I feel about it and it's really simple but if it's online there's so much effort that goes into like just reaching out to somebody and asking 
hey, can you take a look at this? I'm sure about, I'm unsure about it. And then they have to write this whole paragraph about um, the response, whereas in person, it would be very something, very simple yeah. and casual. Yeah, that, that was always fun too. And even random people would, the one thing about OCAD students is that anyone will give you their input. Like some, yeah. I remember being in the studios after class and a person just walked by and gave me like a whole spiel about my artwork and left. And I never got their name. Like, <laughs> it's just like the kind of natural thing that you get. And unfortunately, you don't really get that as much online. But, you know, sometimes following other students in your year on Instagram, you know, creating a Discord group for your chat, super helpful. A lot of people, I I know of their work on Instagram and they look at my work and they give me comments and feedback. I've never actually met them in real life. Like, it's really great. And they're in the same program as me. Like, that's just uh, something that happens. And Instagram is such a great tool for um, for being an artist or designer. I, you should really, really um, utilize it beyond just being a, like a social media platform. And for just the last question, like, what do you think it means to be part of the art community or the OCAD community? Like, how has it, how has it like helped you now that we're gonna be leaving it soon? I feel like we touched on that a bit already. The connections, right? Yeah, like creating a group that is kind of your support system that can help you like very simply in like your struggles, whether it's like applying for things or having somebody edit your work, look at a painting, the simple things like that. Like how I send you all my, everything that I work on, like stupid stuff I'm like, hey, I added this, what do you think? You know, quick things. Yeah, it's just, I did mention this before, but it, it's, it's such a privilege to be around people who are like-minded as you, like the whole school, for the most part, you, you share a lot of the same thinking and for, for an art school, you know, everyone is an individual in their own ways, but it's really nice. And it's very, it's, it's very relieving to look at the person next to you and know that they, they've had the same struggles as you, they've done the same assignments as you. Um, you know, they, they walk around the same school, they get lost in the same building, right? It's just, it's just really, it's, that's, and that's one thing that we're not going to have once we leave um, OCAD, because we're going to go out into the our own art world and find jobs and such and you know try to make money and that that's a whole nother thing that we have to go through as well um but it's, it's one thing that you get to really you're really really lucky to have while you're still while you're still at okay i think the same thing as students applies to profs because they're also part of that community and a lot most of your props will be willing to meet with you outside of hours, maybe after you finish their class and ask them for advice. Like I've met with um, a bunch of my older profs from previous years to get their advice on work that I'm making now because they're kind of familiar with what I've done in their class in the past. And they can give some really good insight on maybe how I've developed as an artist, how my work has developed and how I can improve. Yeah. And um, if you guys ever do research on your props, you'll find out that most of your props went to OCAD too. Yeah. If not all of them, but I think almost all of my props did their undergraduate um, degree at OCAD. And then they came back to teach, which is, it's, it's a very, sometimes it can be really funny, but it's actually really nice because yeah. even like 10 years later, they have the exact same like experiences that you have. So it's, you can, you can, you know, you can actually build quite a friendship with your profs as you get through the years. Yeah, I think this is, that was like a really nice way to end it. I think, where are we? So we're going into a break time. So this is um, where you can, you know, get a drink of water, go to the washroom, or just take a small breather. And we'll be, um, we'll basically be back to share resources. So I collected a, a, a list of resources that I think would be really, really great for anyone who considers themselves to be a young emerging artist or student. And we'll also be there for the Q&A and the informal critique. So if you would like to take part of an informal critique, um, please just have a file of your work and you can send it in the chat and I'll, I'll be able to put it up on the screen and we could all take a look at your work together and kind of get some feedback on that. But 
yeah, I think this is a this is a good time for us to to leave, and then we'll come back. All right. Resume recording. Okay. All right. So this is um, just a pretty, like I made a couple short lists of some resources that I think would be really useful for any current OCAD students to be looking at or anyone who's in um, a student in general. So these ones, this page is particular to OCAD. So I'm going to go through some of them a little bit because I didn't really know what any of these were until I got to, I think, like my third year, which is pretty bad. But it's really nice to be able to at least go through them, even if you don't qualify for a lot of the things they offer when you're younger, because then you'll be able to identify it later on as you um, are, you have the experience and the qualifications to fit them. So Career Launchers is a site where um, there are specific opportunities um, that are given only to OCAD students. So they're usually in partnership with a different institution. So it could be another company, it could be um, an, an art gallery. And I think I think even this position that I have right now as a programs assistant with X, X Space was listed as a career launcher. So it, the only reason I was able to qualify for this position was um, besides like my own experiences and such, I also had to be an OCAD student and I had to be a full-time OSAP student. So a lot of these career launchers are only specific to OCAD students. So that's why I think you should really um, reach out for them. Like me and Claire recently applied for a couple different career launchers in our final year. Um, one of them includes like a, a fund, so a creator fund. So I think it's like 300, 300 or $400. Um, for money for us to be able to um, um, utilize towards our practice. Um, the second link is actually a link that uh, is that leads to the OCAD job board. So that's a little bit different. That's just any position that would kind of um, cater towards a design or art student. And you'll see, depending on your experience, that there's a wide variety of these positions. So I've looked at this job board a lot as well. And some of them are external to OCAD, but they do have to go through like a bit of a screening process before you can um, put it on the work board for OCAD. Um, but some of them are, some of them are like internships, some of them are co-ops, but most of them will be paid opportunities. And they're mainly located in Ontario, but you might see like certain international opportunities as well. There's the Center for Emerging Artists and Designers. And I think that's a really cool resources to look at because that's where you can get a lot of advice for um, if you're looking for work and if you're looking for opportunities as a young student. So with myself and Claire, we both had um, a lot of background in the fine arts world in terms of work and that even before we attended OCAD, we had already um, had previously worked in an art gallery setting. So. For myself, I worked at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, both as a guide and as a 
educator. So I was working a lot with kids. And Claire, you worked at the Barley Gallery, right? Yeah, it's in Markham. Yeah. So we we kind of already had a previous work experience, but a lot of students that go into OCAD don't have any, most of the times, don't really have a lot of experience in the fine arts world. And that totally makes sense because as a young person, it's not an easy, um, it's not always like easy to locate. Um, you don't always have an art gallery in your city that has open positions. It was just something that we were both kind of lucky to have. But finding work um, in particular for the fine arts or, or design world is really different for say like applying for a retail or a food industry job. So a place like the Center for Emerging Artists and Designers, they'll help you with your resumes, your cover letters, they'll put you into contact with companies. Um, sometimes they'll point you in the direction of where you should apply, um, what kind of work or um, opportunities you can get with the current experience you have. And also they'll tell you what kind of experience you need to get before you can even apply for these opportunities, right? So, you know, even getting into a student show at OCAD sometimes, you can put that on your CV or resume and that will be really helpful later on um, when you do end up um, applying for whatever um, position that you want. If you're part of a certain club, if you volunteered or did something for OCAD, that, that can be really, really helpful. Um, the two links here, there's the OCAD use gallery onsite. So onsite is the professional gallery that is part of OCAD. And what, what I mean by that is that most of the artists who showcase in that gallery are either, um, they're kind of past emerging artists. So they're not usually not recent graduates and they're artists who have already had a bit of a career um, in like the fine art or design world. So someone, an artist that we mentioned before, Winnie Chong, she's a graduate from OCAD from like maybe 10 years ago, I think at this point. And she is what someone might describe now as like a, a mid-career artist and that she's already well known. She's had her work in galleries a lot. So she did have a show at Onsite, I think, a year ago. And then Ignite Gallery is the opposite of that. So Ignite Gallery is more internal. A lot of the work is student-based work. And the people who work at Ignite Gallery, they're also largely students or alumni as well. So they focus a lot more on emerging or current students. And that's kind of um, in relation to XSpace as well, like in the beginning, um, we talked a little about XSpace, but XSpace largely focuses on artists who are emerging. So artists who are just at the, who, who they would consider themselves at the beginning of their, um, you know, art career or fine art career. Um, two more links here. There's, um, there's a link for the Indigenous Students um, Center as well. So there is Sometimes if you search it up, it might lead you to two different links. There's a program that is for the Indigenous Arts as well at OCAP, but then there is a center that is for Indigenous students and for anyone else who's trying to, um, you know, speak, speak with um, Indigenous opportunities or Indigenous students. So that's really great if you identify as Indigenous because there are certain workshops, opportunities, and things that are set in place for you. And, um, I think if you uh, take the time to research what OCAD has to offer, you'll notice that there's many things that are in particular to um, what year you're in, what program you're in, also how you identify us. And we also have a black OCAD union as well. They have their own website and everything. And occasionally they'll have their own events, their own shows. And if you, um, if you just check it out on the OCAD U main page, most of the time you'll be able to find all of these links there. If you if you take the time to go through and see what resources are available on the main page, but sometimes the OCAD um, sometimes the OCAD uh, website can be a little bit um, difficult to navigate, uh, especially with the um, Indigenous Students uh, Visual Culture um, Program and the separate center. Like sometimes they're seen as the same thing when you try to search it up and you can't find the social media for one thing or the next. So just try try your best or reach out to someone if you can't if you can't um, access a specific resource or organization or group. And then let's, what's the next one? So these are external resources. So these are resources that um, are outside of OCAD. And the ones that I would in particular pay attention to are Akimbo. Um, Akimbo is like, 
almost like people would consider it to be like the main page for like the fine art world and that all of the exhibitions, a lot of the exhibitions, a lot of the work opportunities are all pasted there. And it's based not only in Ontario, but in Canada as a whole. So you'll hear about things going on in other provinces as well. So through Akimbo, you can actually find other resources that exist and are posted on their page. Um, for someone that's in Ontario, Workman Arts, Lakeshore Arts, those are really great to find opportunities for emerging artists. So this means jobs, exhibition, um, workshops. So sometimes they'll host workshops that are in particular, like the way that we're doing now, um, to maybe learning a specific style, um, an artist talk, all these sort of things. I also know that Lakeshore Arts will offer mini contracts to emerging artists. So they'll hire you, like say, like they wanna do a workshop on anime, they'll hire an artist who can propose a workshop on teaching anime to a certain age group. So say like a school age group, if you send them a proposal, they'll give you a contract and pay you for that day. So really cool ways to get experience um, very fast and um, for a very low commitment. There's uh, Arts Unite, York Region Art Council, um, Slate Art Guide, which will just tell you all the galleries that exist in Ontario. So OCAD is very lucky to sit next to the AGO and also sit next to a whole line of contemporary art galleries. But there's a lot of different places that I would encourage you to visit. So this means art galleries that are really big. There are commercial art galleries. There are artist-run centers. Like, very different environments, but great places that house really, really cool art to look at. And yeah, work and culture is also um, a really um, um, cool place to look at as well, because it only lists opportunities that exist in the fine arts and culture world. And yeah, I think this is a, this is, these are some of the places you should check out on the website, follow them on Instagram because they post opportunities all the time. Um, most of the time on Instagram, if you guys notice, when you follow one page, it has like that little arrow that if you click down, it will show you all of the related um, locations. So you can just try and follow them based off of topic. And then this, this one I'll hand off to Maria. Sorry, I'm muted. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I don't know if there's any DPXA students here, but um, honestly, for animation, what you're going to be learning um, throughout your, your four years here is basically everything that would be in the book of um, the Animator Survival Kit by Richard Williams. We literally get like photocopies of it in the class. Yeah. And um, aside from that, YouTube as a platform has a lot of free resources for animation as well as other mediums. Um, so if you're interested in 3D exploration, um, I rec recommend Mike Herms and um, 2D animation, Howard Wimshurst um, and background art, Jordan Grimmer. 2D and 3D integration is Olaf Storm. And if you want to, I recommend, like this is for anyone who wants to um, experiment with AR but don't know how, um, Art of Vibe is a very, very friendly, um, user-friendly user platform. And it's very, very simple, um, yeah. Um, I'll I'll take all these resources and I'll probably put them in um, an Eventbrite email and it'll just send automatically to you guys if you want to take a look at any of these. So I'm going to go back in and then now we can go into the Q&A portion. So um, we can look at any questions that were left in the chat. I, I don't know if you guys want to, if you guys want to take a look for me. Um, do we have any questions in the chat that we can answer? We have one from Jessica earlier on. Uh, how Maria and Claire, if there was one piece of advice you wish your first, your first yourselves could have known, what would it be? What would it be? You guys want to go first? <laughs> uh, take advantage of like all the free stuff that OCAD gives you, and like. The artist talks, go to them. Like I regret them not going to them so much. I remember me and how we're in third year, like once we were done, we were like, oh, this summer we're gonna go um, to so many artist show, art shows. We're gonna go to so many art talks and then COVID hit and yeah, I miss them so much. Yeah, I miss them too, actually. Like we, I did end up going to a couple by myself and then I mm -hmm. went to a couple 
I went to one with you, Maria, and then one with Claire for, I went with Claire for Winnie Chung. I went yeah. with you, Maria, for like Nestle. Yeah. And um, they were really great. It's really cool to see how like the artists um, work. I, I would say like, if I could tell like my first year self how to do something differently is like, um, you know, don't pull all nighters. I think that's one thing that I did. Like I, I, um, I, I wasn't paying attention to myself in terms of like health. Like I would like stress myself out so much um, to the point of like getting a, like having a lot of anxiety while I was doing my work. And I would stay up nights before, like sometimes two nights for, um, to finish an assignment just so I can get it to critique on time. And I would always justify it by like, oh, I got a good mark on it. Like I got a good response from my professor. Like the work turned out great. So I would keep doing like these really um, terrible habits, but in the long run, it wasn't really good for me and my body. So um, if you can organize your time um, and have an agenda and like, you know, sometimes give yourself a break, um, not every assignment is gonna be a winner, right? So just, just make sure that you prioritize yourself and your body and your mind and health before anything else. Yeah, I'm gonna second that. Um, I think it's very important that you put your health first and that even if you have a painting that's halfway finished, just who cares? Don't pull an all-nighter and don't push your body to its limits because if you do that for four years or even more, it's going to take a toll and I'm like um, doing my own like unpacking and healing after four years of suffering as bad as it sounds, you know, or pushing myself too hard in certain situations that it's affected my health. Um, but a piece of advice that I would give um, to first years and myself is to make friends, to network, um, and to create that support system that we've created, like with how Maria and I, that we can send each other things, um, be really open about what we're doing, and it kind of alleviates the workload that we have now it kind of reassures us that we're on the right track and doing the right things that's um yeah it's it's super nice to have other people to just talk to about our work and rely on one another um let's see what is the next question um this is from lily so lily asks do you ever deal with things like imposter syndrome sometimes i worry that i don't even have anything to say I'm just doing what I think sounds good and that my concepts seem shallow even when I think they're good when I'm making them. Yeah, definitely have imposter syndrome all the time. Um, I think this is where your friend group comes in and saves you from that and telling you that you're doing good. You're on the right track. Stop getting in your mind and psyching yourself out because that's just going to burn you out and no matter how much you rework and overthink a painting, um, you know, just go with your gut feeling and um, your first, I don't want to say first idea, but like um, your strongest idea. Because if you keep overthinking and uh, pushing yourself to change and change and make it more complicated, um, it's, it's going to make your work more complicated in the in the end too. So this is where I think you know that support system is good to keep you in check. Yeah, and I mean, I've I've definitely like had days where I've you know didn't think like my work was worth documenting. Even like I was just like, why am I creating this? Like, like what what is what is the point of me making this if there are so many artists? who are already saying similar ideas or are clearly more talented or skilled than I am. Like, what's the point, right? But like art art in that sense is really beautiful because there are so many different point of views um, and different experiences that are showcased through their work. So, you know, you deserve to have a place in, in the world, right? And a lot of the concepts that um, I come up with and then I put into the final painting, like they don't always work. That's just the nature of art. Like not everything works. Like a lot of people and like myself and Claire and Maria included, a lot of our ideas, we're lucky enough that they do work, right? And then it's so disappointing to spend hours on something and then not be completely happy with it. 
So that's kind of like what art school is for. Like you go to art school not to succeed, but oftentimes you go so you can fail at a lot of different things. And then after those um, terrible attempts or mistakes, you can use those as experience to move forward and actually make good work from it, mm -hmm. right? And that's why it's okay to submit bad work to a critique because you're gonna learn from that experience anyways. Like if you don't feel 100% confident in a painting, that's fine because your peers will help you to improve it. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, is there any other questions? If you guys have questions, you can leave them in the chat or you can turn your mic on and ask a question live. I'm gonna scroll up and see if there was anything. Also like free feel, feel free to like reach out to us or DM us if you wanna talk like one-on-one -on -one or have any specific questions. Let's see. Oh, I know you already technically answered it in the chat, Claire, but um, your your work um, that you do on your the vegetables, like how, do you, how did you um, deal with them afterwards? Um, right now they're sitting in my fridge and rotting. So I painted them like early, I say January and February, but the point of the whole thing is that it's part of the Vanitas or Memento Mori that you will study in art history and that things will eventually rot and die just like our bodies. So I have the fruit rotting in a sort of controlled state in my fridge. Mm -hmm. And I'm recording that kind of passing of time as they rot. That's, I, I really love that. And also like, like it, the fact that it's not, it's not something that's gonna last forever. It's, it's a very interesting concept for art because many, a lot of famous paintings have been around for like thousands of years, right? It's a very well, different- it's to What art is, like we don't have to make a painting that will last that long. Art can be a moment in time. It can be, let's say the three months that I have these, these food produce until I throw them out and then they don't exist anymore or it exists differently throughout time. And then let's see, okay, the next question, what, what advice can you give for me as an avid procrastinator? <laughs> so we're, we're laughing because we had problems with procrastination. I think Maria should take this one. Okay, um, <laughs> honestly, as long, for all my assignments, I, I go by this rule, like, as long as you hand in something, even if it's so, like, if it's half done, a 50 is better than a zero. Like, just having something done so you can look back on is better than having nothing at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually not that bad at procrastination. I, I like I like getting stuff done really, really early. That's good. But, yeah. Um, it's a good feeling when you get it done. We attach a lot of our art to our ourselves, like our self-worth. So I think a lot of students, they won't hand in an assignment because it's bad. Just hand it in. Like, I know it's like, it makes you feel terrible that it's bad, but you should just hand it in. And with procrastination, you do, I think it's hard because you have to adjust to a new kind of schedule. Like art school schedule is different from a high school schedule. Um, the other university schedule too, if you take yeah. it. Yeah. Just, just prioritize your, which assignments you think you care about the most. Cause there are some projects that you don't necessarily have to put in as much time and always give yourself flexibi flexibility in time. So don't say, I only have eight hours to do this painting. That's, I've done that. That's the worst feeling in the world because when you're done the eight hours, that's it, right? The eight hours and then you have to Try to give you, uh, give yourself as much time as possible to work on a project that's more creative based. So a painting, um, a sculpture, um, a design project, like try to give yourself like leeway, like an extra, maybe you need an extra day, maybe you need an extra six hours, right? In that time, you can be a little bit more, um, I don't know, carefree. You can get a couple of I like friends to look at it before you officially hand it in. Like just having a moment to not stress out about your work is, is so is so nice because there have been so many moments where I literally finished a painting right before class and then I had to go present it. And it's at the time I thought it was good because I would get good marks 
on my work. But really, it was so bad. It was so bad for me. And I thought that was the only way you could work. And it's not. <laughs> and I hope that answers your question or gives you a little bit of help. That's a good way to put it. Also, like creating little systems for yourself that works. I would say just experiment. Like if you find like a rewards based system works for you, like I get one thing done today, I can have a snack or I can take a 15 minute break in between these. If I get this done, then I can go outside and go for a walk or do certain things. Mm -hmm. I find that helps me sometimes. Having an agenda can be helpful for some people. Um, I know that there's a tool called Notion, I, I believe now that people use to, to keep as like an online agenda and also as a calendar for their, for their work. A lot, of, a lot of different things that you can attempt to utilize for your your own your own journey as a student but just try your best to you know be healthy <laughs> I would I would friends who keep you accountable mm -hmm. um yeah does anyone else have any other questions yep I think I think we're good and um technically now we would move into the informal critique part and I'm curious to see if anyone wants to participate, but if not, that's completely fine as well. And then we can just move into closing remarks and that'll be the end of our day. Is there anything current that you guys are working on that you'd wanna to share too? Or you can even just in the chat mention a project that you did recently, um, if you liked it or didn't like it. I think. And also like drop your Instagram and stuff so you can just like look through your work if you want. I think we're okay. I think we're okay to end for today. It doesn't. Okay, and we'll go into the final slide. Um, Natalie, are you, would you like to do some closing remarks? <laughs> yes, thank you so much everyone for joining us. That was um, incredible. Um, so many good points that I wish I had when I first started at OCAD. <laughs> um, you all have been so generous with your time and also with like resources. Thank you, Hal. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you to the OCAT SU. If anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to email me, Hal, or Philip with our respective names at xspace.info. Um, we'll be releasing um, some resources like Hal mentioned earlier um, to participants. Um, if you'd like any feedback, or if you're interested in hearing about our open call, you can feel free to also reach out to us at any point. Um, is there anything I'm leaving out? No? I, I think that's good. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And if you just got accepted into OCAD, um, congratulations. Um, I hope that the next couple of years for you are will be good. Um, if you're currently in OCAD, I hope I hope the next couple of years for you will be very um, um, formative to your practice and what you'd like to do after you graduate as well. And if there's anyone who's just here to support or here to learn about like me and Claire um, and Maria's um, art practice, like thank you so much for coming out today. It was really, really nice to talk to all of you. And I think thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Coming. Yes, and have a w lovely day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having us. <laughs>